Welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi. In my previous video, I said that I would upload a Euron theory and analysis, but it is quite a big video to write down and I couldn't finish it. Plus a lot of scouting in various chapters, so I decided to upload this one about Magor that was smaller and easier to write. So, how the hell did Tiana save Magor, who was in a coma for almost a month, in one day? Before the trial of Seven, we need to understand a little bit what was going on prior to this. Contrary to popular belief, personally I don't think that the problem with the faith started when Magor married Alice Haraway, nor when Aenys announced that his eldest daughter Reyna would wed his eldest son and heir, Prince Aegon. Two years prior to Magor's second wedding, in the first years of Aenys' rule, there were four rebellions, one in the Riverlands, one in the Iron Islands, one in the Vale and one in the Dornish marches. Aenys being Aenys didn't handle it very king-like and all the rebellions were crushed by the local lords and Magor. When all these insurrections finally ended, Aenys rewarded all lords and knights who had led the forces against the rebels with gold, titles and lands, and made Magor his hand. One of these lords was Goren Greyjoy, who required that he be allowed to expel the Faith from the Iron Islands, a request that Aenys accepted, and the Faith, of course, had an issue with it. The Faith never was okay with the Targaryens, this is a fact. Prior to the unification of the Seven Kingdoms under one rule, the top dog was obviously the High Septon, since his rule prevailed over that of the local lords. Having a king over his head was obviously not ideal. An envoy from the Iron Bank of Bravos, sent to Old Town to trade with Martin Hightower, the new lord of the Hightower and the voice of Old Town, wrote home to say that the High Septon was the true king of Westeros in all but name. Aenys granted Goran his wish was a move that started to alienate the faith once again, as things were relatively calm for the most part during Aegon's rule. Maegor's wedding and the engagement of Reyna and Aegon were just two very convenient events that helped to turn the pious small folk against the Targaryens. After Maegor's second wedding, in an attempt to calm things down a little, Aenys sent Maegor into exile in Pentos. However, that didn't help at all since after his children's wedding, things got even worse. The warrior sons fortified the Sept of Remembrance on Rhaenys Hill and Aenys, along with his family, decided to leave for Dragonstone. Three days before they were set to sail, two poor fellows scaled the walls of the king's manse on Visenya's hill and slipped into the royal apartments in an attempt to murder him, but one of his guards saved him. A dragonstone Visenya was trying to convince him to take action and bring fire and blood to the Starry Sept and the Sept of Remembrance. Aenys refused, but he also didn't know how to handle this whole mess in general. Aenys fell ill and by late 41 AC, most of the realm was calling him the King Abomination and was against him. Thousands of poor fellows prowled the roads threatening and slaying any of the king's supporters and not only, and dozens of lords took up arms against the Iron Throne. According to Grand Maester Gawain, Aenys looked like a man of 60, even though he was only 35 years old. Aenys briefly improved when Visenya started to take care of him, but he suffered a collapse upon learning that his children, Aegon and Reyna, were besieged at Craighall during their yearly progress, and at the beginning of 42 AC he died. Some people later suggested that Visenya was responsible for Aenys' sudden death, as she was very vocal about his incompetence and preference for her own son, but to me the whole situation smells like Maester's work. Visenya didn't believe he was a good king, and she was correct, Aenys didn't like ruling and wasn't good at it, but that doesn't mean she was going to kill him, especially when she was advising him to crush the people who were causing him trouble. Aenys became better when Visenya was treating him, not when the Maesters did. At the same time, the High Towers, along with various other lords and the Faith, were trying to remove the Targaryens. It sounds to me like the maesters who were treating Aenys were taking orders from Old Town. After Aenys' funeral, Visenya flew to Pentos with Vhagar to retrieve Maegor from exile and accompany him to King's Landing, where she challenged anyone who denied Maegor's claim, resulting in the trial of seven between Maegor and the Warrior Sons. All agree that great deeds were done and mighty blows exchanged until the end found Maegor Targaryen standing alone against Daemon the Devout and Willem the Wanderer. Both of the warrior sons were badly wounded and his grace had black fire in his hand, but even so it was a near thing. Even as he fell, Sir Willem dealt the king with a terrible blow to the head that cracked his helm and left him insensate. Many thought Maegor dead until his mother removed the broken helm. The king breathes, she said. The king lives. The victory was his. For 27 days, Maegor Targaryen lingered at the point of death, while his maesters treated him with potions and poultices, and Septon sprayed above his bed. On the 28th day after the trial of Seven, a ship arrived from Pentos upon the evening tide, carrying two women and 600 Celsors. Alice of House Haraway, Maegor Targaryen's second wife, had returned to Westeros, but not alone. With her sailed another woman, a pale raven haired beauty, known only as Diana of the Tower. Some said the woman was Maegor's concubine, others named her Lady Alice Paramore. 
the natural daughter of a Bentosi magister, Tiana was a tavern dancer who had reason to be a courtesan. She was rumored to be a poisoner and a sorceress as well. Many queer tales were told about her, yet as soon as she arrived, Queen Visenya dismissed her son's maesters and septons and gave Megor over to Tiana's care. The next morning, the king awoke, rising with the sun. When Megor appeared on the walls of the Red Keep, standing between Alice Haraway and Tiana of Pento, the crowds cheered widely and the city erupted in celebration. But the revels died away when Megor mounted Balerion and descended upon the hill of Renice, where 700 of the warrior sons were at their morning prayer in the fortified sept. As Dragonfire set the building aflame, archers and spearmen waited outside for those who came bursting through the doors. It was said the scream of the burning men could be heard throughout the city and a pall of smoke lingered over King's Landing for days. Thus did the cream of the warrior sons meet their fiery end. So what the hell, my guys? Both in this passage from Fire and Blood and in the description of the events we get from the board book, it is obvious that Megor was pretty bad for 27 days and in a coma, and in one only day, Tiana had him ready to go and burn some ass. First of all, from what I understand, Visenya was very much aware that Alice was going to return with Tiana, and it seemed like they were in contact. Alice brought with her 600 cell swords, indicating that they were well prepared for war, including Tiana. It appears that Alice was very familiar with Tiana and knew that she could help, therefore she contacted Visenya. The moment they arrived, Visenya dismissed the maesters and entrusted Megor's care to Tiana. These three were obviously talking and planning, and it's clear that they continued to influence Megor even after he was healed. On the day Megor woke up, he mounted Balerion and went to burn the sept. But we are also told that there were already archers and spearmen outside. Someone had already organized this, and whoever did this was certain that Megor would wake up just fine the next day. In the same year, Megor made Lord Lucas Haraway, father of his wife Queen Alice, his new hand. But it was not the hand who had the king's ear. His grace might rule the seven kingdoms, men whispered, but he himself was ruled by three queens. His mother, Queen Visenya, his paramour, Queen Alice, and the Pentosi witch, Queen Tiana. The mistress of whispers, Tiana was called, and the king's raven, for her black hair. She spoke with rats and spiders, it was said, and all the vermin of King's Landing came to her by night to tell tales of any fool rash enough to speak against the king. Tiana was obviously a witch, and I also think that she did what Midi told Daenerys she would do to save Drogo. Megor was in a coma. So there is no way Tiana pulled a Thoros, since Beric had been dead. Megor wasn't dead, and when he woke up, he was alive. He was sleeping, eating, having intercourse with various women. Basically, he was healed and saved before he died. Miri was a shadowbinder, and from what we saw in the tent, she was indeed practicing that branch of magic at that point. No, she wept. No, please stop it. It's too high. The price is too high. She tried to crawl towards the tent, but Koholo caught her, fingers in her hair. He pulled her head back, and she felt the cold touch of his knife at her throat. My baby, she screamed, and perhaps the gods heard, for as quick as that, Koholo was dead. Agos arrow took him under the arm, pierced his lung, and hugged. The sound of Miriam's door's voice was like a funeral dirge. Inside the tent, the shadows whirled. There is a gap in the story regarding whether Miri was indeed going to save Drogo. I believe the answer lies somewhere between yes and no. <laughs> First of all, there is no way Miri wasn't aware that Drogo wasn't going to follow her orders. Secondly, Miri wanted Drago to die. Danny turned to the god's wife. You warned me that only death could pay for life. I thought you meant the horse. No, Miri Mastur said. That was a lie you told yourself. You knew the price. That was no god's work, Danny said coldly. If I look back, I'm lost. You cheated me. You murdered my child within me. The stallion who mounts the world will bear no cities now. His calasars had trampled no nations into dust. Miri performed the ritual to save Drogo and sacrifice Rego. I believe she was willing to take the risk to save her people from the prophecy. Afterward, she might have intended to kill Drogo immediately after he woke up. I think she would have been 100% willing to take the risk because she had nothing else to lose. After all, Drogo didn't die, so she did indeed keep him alive. Now, the question is, was he left in a vegetative state because she deliberately performed the ritual incorrectly to keep him that way? Or was it because the baby was a dragon baby and the life force wasn't enough to fully save Drogo? Personally, I lean towards the second theory, for the reasons I've explained in another video, the one about the dragon babies. However, we cannot be 100% certain. The only certainty is that it is possible to rapidly heal someone with magic and save them from death. This is blood magic, lady. Only death may pay for life. Only death can pay for life, my lord. A great gift requires a great sacrifice. So if Tiana saved Megor like that, who was the sacrifice? Sacrifices cannot be random. It isn't solely about the king's blood, as Melisandre says. 
you need a person of the same blood. Euron is getting ready to perform a ritual where he is going to sacrifice his unborn child and his brother. Stannis gave his seed, similar to the Night King, Rhaegar was Drogo's child, Craster was giving his sons to the others, and Edric Storm is after all related to Stannis. Even Alice Rivers was rumored to bring forth stillborn in exchange for magic. So someone was sacrificed in order to save Maegor, but who? I think the answer to that is indeed his unborn children. The reason I think that is actually due to Alice Rivers. Alice Rivers as a character appears to be a combination of Tiana of the Tower and Alice Haraway in one character. Alice was the natural daughter of the Lord of Harrenhal, beautiful with black hair and practiced magic. Alice Haraway shared the name Alice and hailed from a house that held Harrenhal, while Tiana was the natural daughter of a magister, also beautiful with raven hair and was a witch. There are way too many commonalities to ignore when drawing the parallels between Tiana of the Tower and Alice Rivers. These similarities extend beyond their backgrounds and appearances. Tiana was said to be able to speak to Vermin and have knowledge of everything that was going on, raising questions about whether she was a skin changer or had abilities similar to Alice Rivers, who also had the power to see everywhere and everyone. Who told you where to find me? My lady, Aemon answered. She saw you in a storm cloud, in a mountain pool at dusk, in the fire we lit to cook our suppers. She sees much and more, my Alice. She also shares a similar description to Varys, not just Alice. This is why I believe she wasn't a skin changer, but a sorceress with abilities akin to Alice, using her talents to perform a role similar to what Varys does. Maegor never had a child, nor had he left anyone pregnant prior to his trial. However, from the moment Tiana healed him, there were three stillborn children. Tiana herself admitted to their deaths and confided in him that his future child would also die. So, yeah, I think that Tiana sacrificed his future children to save him, something that would be on par with what we know. Not only the sacrifice would be his blood, but Maker wanted children more than anything. Azor Ahai tempered Lightbringer with the heart's blood of his own beloved wife. If a man with a thousand cows give one to God, that is nothing. But a man who offers the only cow he owns... And that brings me to the relationship of Tiana with Visenya. Then his grace announced his intent to take Tiana of Pentos as his third wife, though it was whispered that his mother, the Queen Dowager, had no love for the Pentos sorceress. Only Grand Maester Meros dared speak against her openly. Apparently, Visenya wasn't very fond of Tiana, which I personally find somewhat suspicious. Visenya was quick to trust Tiana with Maegor's health initially. However, if Tiana had deceived Visenya, the situation could have changed. Visenya herself was no stranger to magic, and there is no way she wasn't aware that a sacrifice might be needed. But if Tiana had misled her by suggesting that it wasn't necessary, or if she mentioned a different price, as admitted it with Daenerys, or assured her that it was for the future and not an immediate concern, it would make sense for Visenya to mistrust her and develop a dislike for her. And Visenya's death was also shady as hell. When Alice announced her pregnancy, Marking the first time Maegor was believed to become a father, Visenya was on Dragonstone and the description we get of her is interesting to say the least. On Dragonstone, the Dowager King Visenya had grown thin and haggard, the flesh melting from her bones. In the next paragraph, we learn about Alice's pregnancy and how much Maegor wanted the child. However, it ultimately resulted in a stillbirth. Visenya died shortly after Maegor annihilated House Haraway because Diana convinced him that Alice's child wasn't his. The rapid decline in Visenya's health and her quick death afterward raised questions. Why and how did Visenya seem to have the life sucked out of her so suddenly? It's very peculiar that Visenya's death is closely linked to the first stillborn child of her son, Entiana. Could it be that Visenya tried to save the child and sacrifice herself so that Maegor could have the son and heir desired so much? Was it just a coincidence? I don't know, but the first scenario seems more in line with Visenya's character. Visenya loved her son and her family, despite the rumors and the slander she got from many people. It's clear she knew when to be hers and when to negotiate, and was doing everything she could to protect her family. And this is it pretty much, as I said, fairly small video about what might have happened with Maegor, Tiana and Visenya. Maegor was definitely saved magically, and the sacrifice is always required. I think that the sacrifice was his future kids, and Visenya tried to prevent that from happening. If you have other ideas or additions, comment them down below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe if you are not in the ranks. Until the next one, bye!